So, reverse engineering the pyramids. How were they built? So, where do we even begin with something like this? Well, whenever you're analyzing any kind of system, it helps to um, come up with ways of categorizing and um, ways of ranking uh, different things. <clears throat> so, in the problem of uh, building the pyramids, um, you have three main problems. You have um, cutting the stones, you have moving the stones to the job site, and you have stacking the stones on top of each other. And these are the, the three main problems, the three main points of contention uh, whenever discussing this topic. Um, okay, so if we were to rank them in terms of like what's the most important uh, method, what's the least important, we can say that um, the method for moving the stones from the quarry where you've cut them to the job site where you're going to build the pyramids is the least important. It can uh, take as long uh, as necessary. It doesn't have to be a quick method. It could take a thousand years to move the stone from the quarry to the to the job site. And this is sort of, um, we look at this today like factory, industrial kind of logic when you're making a factory line. So, um, if it takes a thousand years to move a block from the quarry to the job site, then if you are able to cut a block out of the quarry every single hour then in a thousand years time you have a block arriving at the job site every single hour even though it takes a thousand years to make the journey now of course if it actually did take a thousand years that would be quite impractical it probably wouldn't be uh, funded but it's um an interesting point to note that the uh, the method for transporting stones doesn't necessarily have to be super efficient and super quick. Um, uh, what's really key is the method for cutting the stones and the method for stacking them. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so. So the method for transporting is the least important. So what's the most important out of cutting the stones and stacking them? And I have to say that stacking the, the stones is the most important part of the entire thing because for one, it's like seems it's a more difficult problem than cutting a stone. Cutting a stone, you just have to like smack it in the right way. Um, and of course, it's always easier said than done. But compared to stacking them on top of each other, these stones are so heavy and massive. Um, so, um, if let's say you use modern methods and tools to build the pyramids. Um, then how we would stack them on top would be to use like a crane that is, um, well, it's got like a hydraulic, uh, pump in it that, uh, does the lifting and that's powered by a diesel engine and, um, and, and that diesel engine, that technology can also be used to make other, 
uh, cutting implements, uh, really efficient cutting tools, and spin really fast with lots of uh, power, and it can also be used to make uh, vehicles that can trucks and whatnot to to transport it, and so. Um, it seems like the method for stacking whatever that is sort of informs the rest of the entire uh, system for how the, how they were built, regardless of what that method is. Um, if it's something like um, aliens or whatever, um, then their sci-fi technology for hovering the blocks and stacking them on top of each other would also mean they have some weird technology for cutting the blocks and, and transporting them and so on and so forth. And so the stacking is like the most the most important problem. Um, and, and definitely the most contentious in the whole the whole debate. Um, because the blocks are so heavy. Um, So we have cutting the stones. Um, now, <laughs> cutting the stones is so fascinating. Simply because there's just so many ways that you could do it. Um, I definitely have to do a whole video or more on different methods and whatnot. Um, but this uh, video here, I've always already touched on previous methods of the video I made about hardness. Um, but in this one here, I want to more focus on the availability of uh, materials for making the cutting tools. Because that seems to be um, a contentious topic too when discussing the, the building of the pyramids. So um, uh, the main one being iron, like whether or not they had access to iron. And so in terms of sources, um, there's of course meteorites which are higher high in iron, um, but they're also not like plentiful on the earth. But what is interesting is that the um, the places where meteorite hunters uh, go to to look for meteorites is in the desert, specifically in um, dried up lake beds because um, they haven't changed um, for so long and there ends up being an even distribution of meteorites all over the globe um, because it gets hit so much but the thing is the probability of finding a meteorite is different all across the globe, right? If you go in the ocean, it's going to be hard to find a meteorite. Or, um, but in a, a dried up lake bed, the, the surface is hard, and um, this allows the meteorite to stay on the surface for a long period of time um, and makes it more likely to be found. And so this is where why meteorite hunters, that's where they tend to go to, to look for meteorites. And um, in a, the area of Egypt, you have, a, this is a lot of the terrain. So you'd be more likely to find meteorites in that area to begin with. Um, and then you have the issue of um, how do you work the meteorite? Um, and that's really interesting. Um, Adam Savage did a video where he went to a foundry and they um, they tried to like blacksmith it and heat up the meteorite and then smash it down and try to form it and work it that way and it was hard to work that way um, 
because of the meteorite, it has uh, it's not just pure iron; it has um, a lot of nickel and um, uh, sometimes crystals and stuff in it too. So um, they weren't able to to work it uh, very easily. But then on the um, water jet ch channel, they were able to make a knife out of a meteorite, and uh, they were able to do that by uh, grinding the meteorite. And what's interesting about grinding is that you would expect in Egypt to have that, that uh, uh, grinding and to grind stones and whatnot would be a technology that they would have had um, because they're, they're working in stone and that's like the, one of the easiest and best ways to, to work stone is just to grind it down. You just get a uh, harder stone to get it spinning and just push it up against the other stone. Um, and and so it makes sense that they would have access to meteorite and then also have the, the technology to um, to be able to work it and to make tools out of it. Now, uh, what's interesting is um, just because they have um, access to iron in this way, it doesn't mean that everyone in Egypt has iron tools, right? Like, um, and we have this today, and in our society, like with a material like titanium. Um, like looking around my place here, I don't have any titanium at all, but maybe in my car I might, there might be a little piece of titanium for one precision piece, or like there might be some some uh, tool that I use at work or something. Um, and so it's material that's available, but it's also rare. Um, and it's not in mass production, but it's also, you can use it to make stuff, or you can use it for mass production, just not, it's just not available for the whole population. Um, just like titanium, you could use it to make a tool to make a whole bunch of things, but you're not making a bunch of titanium tools for everybody to have. Um, and so, like, meteor isn't the only source of iron either. So, um, the other source of iron is iron oxidizing bacteria. This is the uh, most common. Uh, it's like everywhere, all over the world, type of thing. And what's really interesting is that it um, uh, when you see it in the environment, it looks like clay. Um, You'll see like water or something running out of uh, out of a bank or something. Um, today you'd probably see it if you go like around a bridge or a culvert or something, and there'll be like this looks like clay or brown stuff coming out of it, and it's not actually clay. It's this iron oxidizing bacteria, and this bacteria just eats iron, and so it'll. Um, uh, be in places that have a high amount of iron and you could easily mistake this for a clay deposit so um, and so if you're making your clay pottery um, and then you, you end up cooking it or, or baking it down or whatever and then it has like little metal shards in it and then um, <laughs> that's not and then you end up realizing that you can uh, form it into uh, little metal balls there's uh, the primitive technology youtube channel has done a lot of experiments with this stuff um, which is really fascinating um, and So access to iron it seems like they would it would definitely be on their radar, I would think. Now 
another material <clears throat> that seems to be contentious whether or not they would have access to or not is diamonds. Because there's like not many like any naturally occurring in the area. Um But what's interesting, like the <laughs> the the distance that they would go, that they would travel to get a, a huge, heavy, unmovable stone. Um, you know, what's a couple thousand kilometers to get a a super light stone or a a stone that's um, super useful in small amounts, right? Like diamonds, you don't need. For whatever, whatever it is you're doing with diamonds, if you're making jewelry or if you're using making cutting tools or using it for uh, polishing, like diamond dust or whatever, you're not using a lot of it. Like, so like I like walk into Egypt with a backpack full of diamonds that I carried with me on a long journey. You, I mean, you cut the stones with with those for years. Um, Uh, and and not to mention that there there wouldn't be other hard, uh, if not diamond, then other uh, hard materials like other garnets um, can be quite hard. Um, even the sand itself, if you you might be able to sift it uh, or like. spin it, like, sort it by weight or whatever, shake it up, and get parts of the sand that are harder <laughs> than other parts of the sand. Like, there's, um, to get hard material to cut with. I don't think it's a, a huge problem. So that's cutting. Now, removing the stones is an interesting one. Um, a lot of cool stuff here. So, um, it's like the way they have it depicted. Um, and the hieroglyphs and whatnot. Is that they made like sleds and like poured oil or water, or whatever, in front of them and dragged them along? Um, but then people say this is not possible because wood is wouldn't be strong enough to be able to do something like that. Um, now, wood is a really interesting material because it's literally carbon fiber, and so it's like super, super tough um, in terms of like compression and strength and whatnot, like. Um, it's common practice today that people will, um, to get heavy machinery like excavators and whatnot into swampy and muddy areas to work on projects, they'll have these, they call them mats, which will just basically take like a bunch of like 8x8 eight eight, um, beams or 12x12 12 12 beams and uh, strap them all together in these big rafts and then just put them in the mud and then the excavator can drive on top and it doesn't sink into the mud. And these excavators are multi-ton machines and, and the mats aren't breaking under their under their pressure. Um, so there's like a direct example of how that could work. Like they're actually in a wet <laughs> environment with tons of weight on top of them. And if they can handle it just fine, they can handle it just fine. Um,
now. The other thing in terms of moving methods, um, pulleys and ropes seem to be discounted a lot. Um, especially when you get talking about like the unfinished obelisk and whatnot. Um, but what's really interesting is in the Vatican, they have a an obelisk from Egypt uh, that they have on display there. And at one point uh, in our recent history, they moved the obelisk from one part of town to the other part of town. And they documented the whole process for how they did it. And the way they did it was just pulleys and a whole bunch of rope. And they had like the whole town come out and they... They tied up, um, they had this big pulley system that they had, they tied up all the ropes and it was going every which way to everyone, hooked onto like horses and animals and whatnot to get as much power as possible and they uh, go to raise the stone and um, uh, The ropes are just burning and too hot under too much stress or whatever. So then uh, an old fishing uh, a fishing sailor captain guy shows, you can add some water to the ropes and they're too hot. So they go and they dose the ropes with water and they keep adding water to the ropes and the, it lubricates them and cools them down enough and they're able to... Um, lift the obelisk and raise it back up and, and, and get it all set up. Um, and... Stones. If you have like gears, you can. You don't need very many gears together to get a lot of mechanical advantage. Um, so if you had gears, maybe made out of stone or something like that. Um, and you can see there's a lot of videos online of people where they'll make. Um, like a million to one gear ratio gear and they'll basically have like a bunch of just gears stacked all together and the idea being you spin one gear over here and then this one is going to spin like a million times or something and but like if you don't go to that extreme and you go somewhere in the middle where you're getting like a maybe a thousand to one ratio or something like that then you can um or even less than that, then you can uh, get a lot of mechanical advantage to help you lift and move stones around. Um, but of course, Stacking the stones informs everything else because it's the most important method. Okay, so before I get to the actual 
how I think they stack them. I think we need to talk about ramps. <laughs> So in a lot of the theories and depictions of the Egyptians building the pyramids, you always see them using ramps to move the stones up to the higher levels, You're pushing them or dragging them along somehow and, and moving them up the ramps. But as far as I can tell, ramps specifically for building a pyramid are actually quite impractical. So okay. Where do we begin here? So for one Okay, so if we have the pyramid and we're going to build a ramp, so we can move a stone up to the to the next level and place it there. The most efficient way to do that would be to run the ramp around all four sides of the pyramid. So. If you only ran the ramp on one side of the pyramid, let's say that, I know they're not, but let's just say for example that the blocks are one meter high, um, and the pyramid's like a hundred meters wide or whatever, then you have to go from zero meters height to one meters height over a hundred meters. And that makes a, a steep slope. So you have the, all four sides, so you might as well take advantage of them. And if you do that, then on the first side, you only have to go a quarter of a meter over 100 meters. And then the next side, your slope, you go a quarter of a meter over 100, and so on across all four sides. So you have a much gentler slope. And that gets you up to your next level. Okay, but now the the next level of the pyramid is skinnier than the previous one, say it's 90 meters. Um, so that means your ramp, it could go from zero meters height to one meters height over 90 meters, or it could go, or you, you split it up again and go across all four. But either way you do that, it's going to be a steeper slope than the first level. And the level above that, your ramp is going to be a steeper slope again, and steeper and steeper and steeper all the way up. And so this means that it's just like exponentially more dangerous the higher you go to move the blocks up. Um, it, that just doesn't seem wise to me. Um, okay, you can solve that by instead of hugging the pyramid with the ramp, you have the ramp always stay on the outside and go up this way but then the problem is you have to go from the ramp over to where the pyramid is and you have to have a bunch of supporting structure to do that and so that makes uh, a building a much much more difficult um, So then there's like two other ways you could do a ramp. One of them is like cutting it into the pyramid, and the other one would be like 
<clears throat> to make a ramp that like, goes up to the first level, and then you just make the ramp taller in the second level, but like extend it out, and extend it out, and extend it out, and extend it out. Um, but that, of course, would just be a huge engineering project than the pyramid itself, so that would be impractical to do. Um, although you could technically, like, there are ways to stack sand and clay and whatnot. Um, like, they do it on highways all the time. Uh, but, um... Like there's a scene in Breaking Bad where uh, where they disappear, uh, picks people up on the side of the highway, and they have like this like stacked concrete blocks, and that's those are usually placed behind a wall, or those are usually placed in front of a wall that's been made out of dirt where they've taken like sand and clay, and if you layer sand and clay you can stack it up like you just layer sand you can't really stack it up you just layer clay you can't really stack it up and if you do layers you can and then that um the wall prevents erosion from the front of it um, you'll see that type of stuff so like you might be able to stack i don't know it seems kind of far fetched but you have to consider all the possibilities. Um, so, so the other one would be um, cutting it into the pyramids. Um, That's interesting, but I, the um, the problem with it would be that you'd have wear on your ramp, and then if you're so the idea being that you leave a part of the pyramid as you're building it up, so you can use it as a ramp, and they have to like like the pyramid blocks themselves aren't ramps. Have to, so you're building some other ramp in there, I guess. Um, it also, um, you have the problem, like, once you remove that ramp material and then try to place in, like I said, you do, then you would go and, once you build the pyramid up, you then go and do the ramp where the ramp was. Um, but like when, like whenever you're making stuff, it like you, it seems like you wouldn't be able to get it to fit right. You know, because you just get jostled it. Like I don't know, it, because of the wear from. Seems like there'd be some visible evidence of that, but um, it doesn't matter because I don't think you need ramps to stack the stones on top of each other. So all you need to do is to be able to um, roll the blocks on top of each other. And what's interesting about this, if you're, okay, so rolling the blocks, what do I mean? So the blocks are square, so you'd have to have some sort of padding around them 
to make them round. And there's been other experiments and whatnot to um, uh, to test this out, and it is it does make it easier to to move the block when you build sort of like they do like a basket kind of technique to build out with wood and uh, to build this round basket so that you can then roll the block. Um, Now, what's cool about this is that you can have people on every single side of the pyramid rolling blocks up the pyramid to then have them be placed. And like another thing with building the pyramids is the, the time estimation of estimating how much time it would take to move and, and work all of the material. And I think a lot of them are assuming that you're building with a ramp, which means that you have to place the blocks one at a time, which is really slow. But if you're if you have them all spun up in this round basket and you can just roll them up then you're working in parallel. You're placing multiple stones at a time, uh, which would increase the construction time dramatically. Um, another thing that would increase the construction time dramatically is not building the entire thing out of blocks, which I know I've seen proposed before. Um, which is it's it's an interesting thing. We don't actually know. For certain, like what's in the center of of the pyramids, like the we can do scans to detect voids, but we can't do scans to detect like the millimeter void that would be between blocks and be able to see every single block in that pyramid. We can't do that. Um, we haven't gone and drilled them all the way through because you <laughs> you they look like Swiss cheese, and that wouldn't be a good thing to do. Um, now, I, I think we assume that they're 100% made out of blocks because there's other, there's like another pyramid that, um, it's like all tore apart or whatever, but it was made out of smaller blocks than the Great Pyramids are. And so, I can assume it might be a different construction technique with a different size block. Um, And so one of the things people propose that they just like take sand and rubble and whatnot and sort of shove that in the in the middle and you or well you'd like place like maybe a couple rows of blocks down and then you fill the middle with rubble, sand, garbage and everything, pat it all down, and then do the next layer. And <laughs> what's interesting about this technique is that this is um uh is a sort of like mound building technology, which I think is also um, uh, found in Egypt and because they'd, they'd take their dead and then they would build a mound. They would, uh, wouldn't bury them under the ground. They would build a mound on top of them. Um, and so if you're building a mound, you're building a dirt, you clay and whatnot, you're not building it stone um, and so uh, what's, what's so interesting about that as well is like um, so if you imagine that you have this culture that built mounds uh, to honor their dead and then the culture ramps up and they get more and more technology and they start building more and more epic mounds to to honor their dead and they they sort of advance this mound building technology and then you get to the point of building the great pyramids and so 
it's like an extension of the mound building technology, which was used to honor the dead, and which is why people always say that that's what they are, is the tomb for so-and-so and whatnot. These are tombs to honor certain kings that they once had. But then there's also contention because it seems like they were had some other technological purpose, maybe. And so both things can, can sort of be true here because it's like the... Yes, maybe they were built for another purpose, but the technology that they built it with was the the mound building technology that they used to honor their dead. And so there's, it might just be something that's a little bit lost in translation where... Um, originally they weren't actually tombs, but then maybe later, and then of course later on maybe they were um, turned into tombs or whatever. But the story is still stuck that they were, because it's a tomb building technology, um, just taken to the extreme. Now, what's if we consider that they were taking the blocks and building these sort of baskets around them to be able to roll them around easier? And like I was saying before, how the stacking stones is the most important thing and forms the rest of the society, basically. And so if we consider the... that they were weaving these baskets around the stones has unlocked a whole bunch of other things to explain a bunch of other things about how the society might have operated. So, so, historically, when people trade with each other, they would, um, trade bales and they give a bale of hay or a, a bale of cotton or a bale of whatever material and um, uh, we see this um, on um, Oak Island you know they found um uh, bale seals, which like this metal stamp, basically that they would stamp on their uh, the bale to say, you know, whatever information, whatever king it was for, or whatever, say that it was certified to be shipped or whatever, whatnot. Um, and <laughs> so. What and so if you're trying to take these blocks and wrap them up want to wrap them up in other things like bail it with material that you could be used for another purpose so like the, you're not the trade isn't just sending rocks down the river right it's more than that it's You have these rocks, maybe you take clothing or something, or whatever things, and you bail it up, and you wrap it up, and now you have this boat full of product, and this stone that's going to be used to build this amazing thing, and you just take that, and you send it down the river. And, um, floats down the river, maybe you have people to help guide them, and whatnot, if they get stuck, and... Then you make it down to the end, and you can roll them out, and 
roll them up, unpack them, and I have all this other material you can take and, and use for other purposes. Um, right, or you could, um, it could be much more ceremonial where you're not necessarily uh, putting valuable goods around these stones, but you're just uh, putting flammable stuff, so it's just a, a fun show, so you have the the block, and then you uh, you roll it into place, and then you can light the the stuff on fire and burn off everything on the outside, and then perhaps even use the burning itself to uh, as materials burning away to help shift the stone and push it um, into place. But what's so cool about, like, another thing when thinking about how these people accomplish all these tasks, another key tool in thinking about it is the people that were there at the time were people that had the same genetic makeup that we did. So they have the... Um, the same potential for intelligence, the same uh, needs, wants, and desires as us, the same, they would react to situations in the same way as we do because they're genetically identical. So, so that means we can use our own society as a way to um, reflect and think about what their society might have been like. Um, and in the problem of uh, transporting the stones, and um, so like today, if you have something valuable, you need to transport from one location to another. Like say you um, you buy your new phone online, um, you have to wrap you. It's valuable. You have to wrap it up, right? Like, you're not going to just send the phone raw from <laughs> Apple's headquarters in California to wherever you live and have people just handle it and, and pass along the way, right? Like, yeah, you put a, a, you wrap it in a little bit of plastic and some cardboard and then some other cardboard and then, and then that gets put on a pallet and the pallet goes in a truck and the truck is on wheels and then, and so you just wrap it in layers and layers and layers. Um, and sort of all of history, like that's how you transport stuff. It's always you wrap it in layers and layers and layers um, to protect it if it's something valuable. And like a big stone you're using to build something as epic as the pyramids would be something valuable that you'd want to wrap up and protect. You don't want it to be uh, chipped, chipping apart on the journey to the job site you you want it to arrive there all in one piece um, um, and you know, when we get into cutting there's, oh, there's so much cool stuff here like because it could be that the um, the um, that the stones were fit together in the quarry and then reassembled at the job site. There is some that are weirdly precisely fit together. And so are you doing that when you're placing the stones and carving them down and shaping them in in place? To do that, you need, you need cutting tools and and whatnot to work the stone, but you already have cutting tools and whatnot to work the stone at the quarry, right? So 
and so it makes sense if you're going to have these blocks fit together. Well, a block only has six sides, so it has six blocks that it can touch. So any single block in the pyramid only needs a knowledge of the other six blocks that it might be touching around it. So that so you don't need to have every single block ready at the quarry and shape and fit together before you send them down to God down to um uh Giza on the job site. So that's so fascinating. That you could that you could have all of these blocks, the plan to fit them together and have them all transported, arrive in the right sequence, have them <laughs> just so you know which ones fit next to each other. And and that technique could be used elsewhere as well. You see in other places like Peru, where they have these big blocks that are like precisely fit together. It could be possible that they're taking these blocks and they're milling them, uh, say, by the river or whatnot to have a mill set up and then they're using certain different cutting techniques to then uh, fit them together and confirm that they fit and then ship them off to then be assembled. Um, And even if they weren't, if they were fitting them on on site, the whole thing is just so crazy. So, <laughs> oh, what else do we have here? So we have the three important things. Sacking, moving, cutting the stones, stacking, wrap them up. The coolest thing about thinking about this whole thing to me is that it's just people getting along and working together. Um, like you don't, <laughs> you don't just get the pyramids when you have a bunch of people at war with each other. Or fighting with each other over nonsense. You get the pyramids when you have a bunch of people getting along with each other. Um, which is cool to know that it's possible. Um, Here's one little addendum I guess I'll throw on here. Um, I think in Egyptian culture, 
they might not have had the same word we use for it, but I think they would have had a similar concept to reverse engineering. Um, and like we see the um, there's the hieroglyphs of the, the cup and ball magic trick that we see there in Egypt, and so we know that they had magic in their culture. And magic, the, the culture of magic, is reverse engineering. That's how you figure out how to do magic tricks. Like, um, that's how you, not only, like, when you're, like, watching someone else do a magic trick and figuring out how to do it, but then when you're actually figuring out how to, how to do a magic trick, you do reverse engineering. You, you oftentimes, you start at the end of the trick, and then work your way backwards to the beginning and say, okay, well, I want to make um, the coin disappear. Well, how do I do that? Well, I have to show that it's here first, and then I have to you know, hold it in my hand and then make it disappear. It's always working backwards with magic. The thinking there. Um, there's also an interesting... thing um, a picture is worth a thousand words right that's something that we have in our culture I think in the Egyptian culture they would have had a similar kind of concept like a sort of show don't tell a similar kind of thing um, and we see this uh, the most famous example is there's the this really beautiful polished statue that they have in one of the museums and in between the feet, there's like a drill, a clear drill mark. And then like in like the armpit or whatever, you can see the the blade mark where they uh, where they made the cut in the stone. Um, and I think what we're seeing, we're not seeing shoddy craftsmanship here. We're seeing a picture worth a thousand words. This is the the documentation for how it was done. They're um, We see this in other places too. There's that island um, that has this like, like little stone room or whatever that has some really nice uh, features on it, but then at one part it's unfinished. And but like the way it's unfinished, it's kind of showing you how it was done, where they like, the end result is to have this beautiful, rounded, uh, beveled corner thing on the this uh, big stone box room thing, and, uh, but then on part of it they show where it's like, it was cut square, and then they like smoothed it off a little bit, and then they smoothed it off more finally. And that just so happens to be on the back side of it. It's not on like the front side. And so, right, you see other places where there's like the, the extended cut marks into the wall at, at certain places. There's, um, uh, where they've gone and smoothed out the, um, where you can see where they clearly stacked up the, the bricks for the wall. And then they gone and smoothed the moat afterwards. They didn't have to worry about the bricks being perfectly aligned. They just smoothed it out. Then in places it's unfinished, not smoothed out all the way. That's because they're telling you how they did it, like the where they'll leave like the nubs on, um, and those nubs will tell you that how big the uh, the tool was that they were using uh, to grind them down because it would have to fit between the two nubs. Um, uh, And so you can see they're kind of like trying to tell you how how they built it um, in having the stuff look like it's unfinished. It's really the documentation because um, like in their in their culture, they would have had enough history to know that uh, language changes. Like the whatever language 
is used in this city at a particular time is the language of whatever <laughs> king took over the city. Like, uh, and even if you have, like, the same king over time, the language changes over time, and so writing down in words how you build something isn't going to, uh, isn't going to preserve it as well as just, um, leaving evidence in the thing you built for how you built it. That's a much, much better way to document it. And it needs no words because a picture is worth, is worth a thousand words. Um, I think this is an insanely clever, uh, thing that the Egyptians did. So much fun to think about, and that's just scraping the iceberg. Barely scraping the iceberg. 